Welcome back to another ooh inflation report. You know, it, it seems like you've always got some kind of catalyst coming up, huh? We've got uh, another one now. We've got a uh, good old right here BPI coming that's going to try to rug the darn markets again. Uh, we shall see, but uh, the producer price inflation report comes out today. We've got uh, the queues today uh, really uh, in the pre-market playing the same game that we played yesterday, uh, which if you noticed yesterday, uh, multiple times yesterday, the queues bounced off of this, uh, where was it? Let's see here, queues, there we go. Look at that bounce on that 438 line. Uh, I mean, over and over and over again, that 438.90 line uh, was the line that I had drawn. I drew this maybe, oh, I don't know, five days ago or something like that. It's one of the reasons it's a yellow. Uh, the yellow is sort of a, just a, a line that I use for day trading. And yesterday, I'm like, this is remarkable. We're literally barcoding off of that over and over and over again. Uh, and we're doing the same thing here in the pre-market. So be kind of curious to see if uh, today that remains uh, to be another resistance. I suppose it probably will be if we get a bad PPI report. I mean, in that case, we might drop below uh, the next one here. So uh, we shall see. But uh, yeah, we are now two and a half minutes away from the good old PPI report. And... Um, that is the producer price inflation report, which is a little less important for uh, understanding where consumer inflation is going, uh, as it doesn't necessarily flow all the way through. So uh, you could have a good read on PPI and still have to deal with the bad news of CPI. But let's put it this way. It would be nice to offset some of the pain of yesterday's CPI report to get a good PPI report today. Uh, at least from a trading point of view, uh, it's not necessarily going to make the biggest difference, I think, for interest rates. Uh, but uh, sentiment will certainly be affected in a positive way if we could get a softer report here on uh, PPI. Right now, you've got all the indices down at least one third uh, of 1%. Uh, it's so we are uh, hoping to get uh, some softness here. Uh, at the same time, you just had the European Central Bank uh, holding their interest rates steady. They weren't really expected to cut uh, this uh, uh, cycle anyway. Uh, we need a few more months for the ECB to cut, but they are expected to cut before the Federal Reserve. Okay, so we are now uh, looking like we are... Uh, let's see here. We are... Okay, PPI final demand, one minute to go, and then we're also going to get claims. So we're going to get, we get, uh, let's see, Thursday, yeah, initial jobless claims we're going to get, we're looking for 215,000, continuing claims, 1.8 million, PPI final demand, we're looking for 0.3, uh, PPI X food energy, 0.2, X food energy trade, 0.2, final demand year over year, 2.2. Those are the uh, expectations right now. So uh, let's see what we got. Uh, we're going to get this out here again, about 30 seconds here. And uh, we are excited to find out what happens. Uh, again, I, I think this one matters a little less uh, just because it doesn't affect consumer prices so heavily. But there is, of course, some pull through. Uh, and we'll, so we'll see what we got. All righty then. Here we go. So... Uh, okay, PPI, okay, basically bang on expectations. You've got uh, core 0 0.2, 0 0.2, final demand actually comes in soft on headline, which is good news. So you have a, a 0.1 basis point miss on final demand month over month. Uh, core comes in at expectations. Core uh, minus trade comes in at expectations. Year over year comes in at 2.1, but year over year X food and energy comes in 0.1 hot. So it's kind of like, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Continuing claims are basically at expectation, 211 versus 215. Uh, that's initial claims. Continuing claims are at uh, 1.817 versus the 1.8 million. And uh, a nominal revision on the initial claims for last week. So this is really like a, 
we got nothing kind of report is what it feels like. Let's let's see how uh, they, they read it off. But for me, this this feels pretty uh, pretty bang on expectations here, which which is good that it's not hot. Remember, at consensus is good. Two we're expecting comes in at 2.1. That follows 1.6. 2.1 there is the hottest level going back to April. So there's the first number that is definitely a bit hotter than our last look, even though it's a little less than expectations. Many are going to compare it to the actual number. Strip out food and energy. Uh, so we go from headline to core. 2.4, higher than anticipated, much higher than a 2.0 in the rear view mirror. 2.4 is the highest since August of last year. And finally, uh, 2.8 is our X food energy and trade that follows 2.8, which actually was revised to 2.7. These 2.8 numbers are basically running where we were in September last year when it was a little hotter at 2.9. Initial continuing claims quickly, 211 on initial claims, less than expected, and 1,800,000. Uh, when it comes to continuing claims, very close to expectations, and both those metrics stay relatively depressed. We see that interest rates move down a little bit, 455 from 457, twos from just a whisker under 5% to 494, 494 and a half. So the PPI numbers, even though they were a bit hotter, they definitely seem to, on the month over month, assuage some wholesale inflation fears. Becky, back to you. Yeah, I think that's the good way to put it. It's it's like a little bit of good news. It's not that crazy reheating that we saw in the CPI yesterday. So that's good. Uh, you don't want too many days of, of people freaking out over inflation, though. Again, like I said, you're still going to deal with some of it. Uh, it does look like uh, the market is, uh, you know, nominally excited about that. Uh, the, the Qs were down about a third of a percent, so it does seem like you're trying to pop up. You're about 15 basis points up. So it is being celebrated. I mean, you got green candles here uh, across the board from what I could see on the five-minute chart. Let me go to the one-minute chart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Look at that. Right to our line over here. Uh, you know, NVIDIA, I'm pretty sure, was red. It, 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 um, uh, in the pre-market here, look at that. You added about, wow, look at that. You added about $10 in the pre-market here to NVIDIA instantly. Uh, Arm added about, ooh, a dollar and a half. Uh, I mean, all of these were red. Tesla was red by about 50 basis points. Yeah, everything really enjoys this right now. So there you go. So uh, interesting. Uh, that is, That is, again, that headline number which is affected by food and energy comes in at 0.2 versus 0.3 the uh food energy trade number that comes in at expectations at 0.2 also had a revision down you went from 0.4 in the prior to 0.3 which is really good and uh and that headline missed by 0.1 on uh, year over year which does include the food and energy and uh, you you had really the only bad part was that x food and energy uh, year over year came in 0.1 higher, but but I mean that's relatively nominal because you had a revision of the last prior down 0.1. So so really overall that's that's pretty good. Uh, no no scary PPI to follow a scary CPI. And remember uh, producer prices are uh, or some would say a lot more affected by supply chains normalizing compared to the demand for personal services, which are really driving some of those uh, uh, that are driven by labor costs. And uh, those are the costs that are really driving some of the CPI considerations. Okay, so let's get into the producer price index report. Producer price index for final demand rose 0.2% in March, seasonally adjusted, fine. Okay, let's see here. 0.3% rise in prices for final demand services. That makes sense. Services moving in producers as well, uh, even though that, that hits a little more on CPI. The final index for final demand services moved up 0.3% in March. The third consecutive uh, rise, uh, the leading broad-based March increase, prices for final demand services, less trade transportation. Warehousing accounted for 0.2%. Fine. Uh, final demand transportation and warehousing, these two items moved up 0.8%. That's quite a lot. So warehousing and transportation. Major factor in the March increase was the price for final demand services, which included securities brokerage, dealing, investment advice, and related services, which rose 3.1%. Yeah, it's that labor-affected uh, uh, portion of the market again. The index for professional and commercial equipment wholesaling, 
airline passenger services, investment banking, deposit services, computer hardware, software services, retailing also moved higher. Conversely, prices for traveler accommodation declined 3.8%. Ooh, that sounds like it's like hotels. Interesting. The index for automobiles uh, and machining parts, as well as supplies wholesaling, fell. Good. Uh, let's see here. I always like kind of seeing on PPI kind of which, which items they're seeing are hot and soft. And so again, it looks like that services sector, financial services, advice, otherwise. Travel or accommodation coming in down though, that's interesting. Product detail, uh, leading the March decline was uh, the price of gas. Not, uh, what is this? This is, uh, this is gasoline rather. Index for chicken eggs, carbon scrap steel. Uh, jet fuel, fresh fruits also fell. Conversely, the price for poultry jumped 10.7%. These are volatile items that move a lot on a regular basis here. So very enthusiastic though. The market is, as much as the market was upset about uh, the moves we had yesterday, the market is cheering PPI today, uh, at least in the pre-market. We'll see if it holds. Yesterday, you could see the queues really held in the face of that nasty CPI. Uh, we really just barcoded between these two levels here. And these levels were not drawn yesterday. Otherwise, obviously, I would have moved the lower level up. But they kind of just show you some, some larger trends that we've seen on different days. And uh, you can see we really respected those lines yesterday. And it goes to show not breaking down yesterday. Uh, it goes to show, in my opinion, the market wants to be bullish. The market wants to deploy capital. Uh, the market doesn't want to be in a place where you are, uh, you know, suffering uh, and not able to invest more. Uh, it seems like people are desiring to invest more. So uh, I think that's uh, very interesting. This market takes it excitingly. Let's listen in to see if there's some more commentary here. Early AI models have been built by NVIDIA. But supply is more scarce, and people are concerned about cost, and so we've built our own right. uh, custom silicon and AI. We've built a training chip called Tranium and an inference chip called Inferentia that are meaningfully more price performant than what you can find out there. So a lot of the training, a lot of the right. predictions are going to be done on those chips. And, uh, you know, and then I would say at that middle layer of the stack are for people that are going to actually leverage somebody else's model but customize it with their own data and then use our features to make it easy as a service. And we built the service called Bedrock and a lot of the generative AI applications are being built on top of Bedrock because it's the easiest way to build a high quality generative AI application. Then there's the applications of which, you know, we're building a lot of them ourselves, but the vast majority of those right. will be built by third parties, and we're optimistic a lot of them will be built on AI. Well, let me ask you this. Let's talk about large language models because there's yeah. just so much focus on it. Um, you have now made investments in Anthropic, Mm -hmm. uh, which Google has also made an investment in. You're building your own large language model called Olympus. How are you thinking about investing in things like an Anthropic versus trying to build your own? Well, I think the one thing that we've seen pretty consistently in this relatively early stage of generative, generative AI is that customers want choice. You know, they're, they're learning how to build models. They want different model types for different types of applications and use cases. They want different model sizes because it changes right. the latency and, and the cost structure. And so, you know, part of the attraction for so many people of Bedrock, I was just mentioning, is just it has the largest selection of models available. Scott. All right, a lot of excitement there on AI models and chips from the Amazon team. So uh, let's take a peek at how BTC is moving on this as well. We've got uh, end phase uh, up 1.29 here, breaking above that 119. Tesla up 45 bips here. Bitcoin, yeah, look at that. Even Bitcoin moves. Uh, again, this is a sign of uh, Bitcoin not moving as an inflation hedge, but rather moving as a risk asset or store value or a uh, tool to escape the latches of the government. Uh, anyway, so... Yeah, this is good news on PPI. Stable continuing claims, which is also good for the economy. Yeah, clearly, uh, you know, we have a we have a hot CPI yesterday that we'll just have to deal with over the next few months. And uh, but let's see how much this really affects interest rates. Yeah, I'm actually surprised you've got the, the, what I wasn't expecting to move much much were interest rates. You did pull them down about two basis points from yesterday. Uh, they were up a, a two basis points this morning, so you did get about a four basis point swing. 
So I'm gonna write that down. Swung, uh, so uh, mostly good data. Swung 10 year uh, from up two basis points to down uh, 2.9 basis points now to 4.531%. So yeah, I, I, I think this is, again, overall a good report. So again, in case you're just now joining, that PPI final demand number came in at 0.2% versus the 0.3 expected. We got uh, PPI uh, X food and energy that came in at 0.2. Uh, which was the 0.2 expected, PPI food and energy, uh, or PPI X food energy trade comes in also at 0.2 versus the 0.2 uh, expected final demand year over year. Uh, that comes in at uh, 2.1 versus the 2.2 percent expected. So again, a miss there, uh, as in as or or like a positive lower number and uh and then uh, the only smidgen that was higher was really the year over year x food energy x food energy coming in at 2.4 versus the 2.3 expected uh and yeah and then initial claims positive initial claims at expectations we'll call that uh what do we got here that's a 2 to 11k i mean that's a pretty good estimate versus the 215k expected uh, and continuing claims Ooh, initial this is overall I think just good news across the board and continuing so okay 1800 versus 1817 there we go 1.817 million versus the 1.8 mil expected great cool that's done so uh, now the question is just how how does this affect the Federal Reserve? Does it affect the Federal Reserve at all? Uh, maybe. It's sort of a way that the Federal Reserve could argue, they could try to argue, because really their job is stable prices for, for the consumption level. You know, they look at PCE uh, and CPI, therefore. So maybe you could look at it and say, hey, you know, this is evidence that... Uh, Maybe some of those consumer numbers are just lumpy for the first quarter. And as long as producer prices come down, may, may, maybe CPI will come down as well. But, but producer prices have been coming down for a while longer than CPI. I wonder if I look at it, historical sort of chart of CP or uh, PPI rather. Let's do the year over year. Yeah, see, you're also getting, I'll throw this up on screen in just a sec. You're also getting a little bit of a reacceleration in PPI. It's nowhere near as pronounced as CPI. But when you throw this up on the screen here, let's see here. Let's do this. Okay. Okay. So take a peek here. Here's the PPI chart. And what you could see is you have obviously our wild surge to nearly 10% over here on producer prices. And uh, you could see the survey line is actually pretty dang close to the latest line. Like PPI is much better at coming in at, at expectations. But if you go over here, you see that same sort of lumpy resurgence happening that you're seeing in CPI, except it's much less pronounced than what you're getting in CPI. But, but you are still getting it. So that is uh, it's going to be something to pay attention to. This uh, And that was the core level, which that core level did come in a little higher than expected. The last read was 2.0, and we just got uh, that revised up to 2.1, and then uh, 2.4 on the headline with vision of prior up. There we go. So that's the only part that's hot is that final demand year-over-year -year X food energy. The rest mostly at expectations or lower. Okay, good. So I guess we also just make the quick little summary note that uh, report noted that, oh, what was it? Right here we had 
final demand transportation and warehousing services up 0.8%. That was quite a bit. And then final demand services up 0.3. 0.3%. And then financial services up 3.1%, which was wild. Traveler accommodation down 3.8% services. Cool. All right. That's a good little summary. Then uh, let's see what's going on with BT Sizzle here. So BT Sizzle is trying to cap out at uh, 71K. You know, it did that yesterday as well. Yeah, you were just a little over 71 over here, and then you kind of ca capped out. You've actually pulled... Uh, a move on this before. Look at that right there, about 71.1. Likes to top out at about 71.1. It's done that a couple times now. 71. Yeah, here's another one at 71. This is on the 30 minute chart. Let's see if it's done this before. Yeah, 70. 71.1 has come up a few times before. I'm going to throw on the 30 minute. I'm going to throw a quick little. More day trady line here. 71. We'll go right at 71.1. Oh, yep. I thought they hit horizontal. So there we go. 71.1. And let's go ahead and make that yellow. Perfect. So uh, these uh, these I always like testing. And then if, if they consistently work, I'll change their color. But... Uh, yeah, that one seems pretty good. So we'll watch that level. Uh, NVIDIA is pairing a little bit after its enthusiasm. Yeah, again, I, I think PPI really, it's nice. It's a, like a nice to have, but it's not really a need. So CPI and PCE reports that matter so heavily. Uh, and uh, you've still got bonds down about 2.2% or uh, basis points. And every index did go green after that. We were down one third on every index: Dow, S and P 500, Nas, and uh, now we're slightly up. Uh, though it does seem like some of those gains, some of that enthusiasm is being paired just a little bit. Uh, yeah, Tesla's back to roughly about zero on the day, and uh, let's see what our real movers here are. Pre-market. You've got Robinhood down about 3%. Embraer is over here down about a percent. Uh, less than a page of red. Matterport up about 3 though this thing moves a lot. I mean, yesterday it was, up, it was down 5%. And uh, Enphase up about 1%. And yesterday it was down about 2 All right. Very well. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. Break-evens. Okay, yeah. Let's take a look at the five-year break-even. I mean, based on that data, it should be down slightly, maybe back down to 2.5. Five-year break-even is, nope, stable. And it's been 19 minutes, so we should have an update on that. Okay, so five-year break-even. This sits at 2.54, stable high for the last year after, after the report. Let's see if there's any change to pricing on cuts. Yesterday we were looking at one point, I think five nine or six nine. One point seven eight. Uh, so one point seven eight cuts are priced in for December right now. Uh, one point seven eight cuts priced in for December eighteen, twenty twenty four. Uh, buy. I should say buy, not four. There we go. All right. So, next, we are going to take a peeky at oh, what else uh, suits are saying here in the morning. I don't think the PPI doesn't get as much. Yeah, PPI doesn't get all the attention the others do. Uh, we'll also take a look if Nick T had anything to say. So, some of, one of the headlines here is PPI uh, has evidently proved a little relief with headline inflation coming in lower than expected. And one of the core measures revised lower in February. Economists will parse the details to fill in the blanks for PCE forecasts. True. 
PCE does pull a little bit from PPI as well as CPI. So that might be reason why the market is a little bit optimistic. Uh, let's see here. But uh, there wasn't any obvious CPI shocker here. Yeah, I agree with that. Earlier reads of the PCE figure should be a little more benign than the CPI number. So to the extent that they, uh, the asset recovery makes some sense. Fair. It's a way of softening PCE is or uh, below a little bit, or CPI is below. Yields edge slightly lower after mostly in line PPI. Euro extends deadline as ECB keeps rates unchanged, extended its day's losses against the dollar after the ECB kept rates ex um, stable. All right. Now. Okay, dokie. Let's see what other people are saying. Ha 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 ha. Fed Williams. Oh, I didn't know he was chatting. Let's find out what he has to say. Okay, dokie. So Fed Williams expects unemployment rate to peak at four percent this year. Tremendous progress towards balance, but not over yet. Yeah. Job market remains strong. Housing remains strong. Doesn't see a sign of a bubble. Focused on getting inflation back to 2%. Fed must be data dependent, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is all pretty generic. Okay. Okay, so producer price index seems mostly happy. Yeah, I don't see too many upset people here. Uh, the only thing would be that sort of slight little resurgence of a chart that we saw. I put that over on eHack, uh, and that is uh, that is sort of this this little bit of a bounce over here. It's a little more pronounced than what you saw here and here on the way down. That's all. And they're selling it as a third-party merchant on an Amazon, on an eBay, on these other kinds of services. Yeah. It doesn't happen. I mean, again, at our scale, you find some of everything. But we have a, we have a really significant team that, that looks for that. And to get author, it's not, you know, you have to get authorization as a seller. We have a group of people looking for items. Right. Whenever we get reports, we act on it. So we have a group of people that are watching that very right. carefully. One of the, the stats this year that's just uh, mind-bending is just how big an advertising business you have. Mm. I mean, it just it's really grown uh, quite uh, remarkably, uh, growing 24% year over year, $38 billion in 2022, now $47 uh, billion in 2023. How should we think about Amazon in that regard? And what is it, where does this go? Well, you know, look, advertising doesn't work unless you provide the right experience for customers and they respond to it and, and then it actually benefits the brands who are advertising. So we, you know, most of our average That's interesting. Advertising doesn't work unless they respond to it. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, if people don't respond to your ads, it don't work. Uh, let's see. Do you think Kevin shorted the market because he thought PBR is going to hot? Now, I usually don't like playing these because I see them as like a 50-50 gamble. It's very hard for me to have an intuition in terms of which way it's going to go. Uh, I, I much prefer watching the lines that we draw because I look at the market not only in these live streams all day long, but then all day, you know, when, when I'm in the office or uh, with we're talking with the team or whatever. And so, we, you know, when we see these trends, it's a lot easier to trade off of them. Uh, when you're intraday, you're bouncing off the of lines, you can make some predictions and uh, and make some money. See, I'd rather be, like, my, the goal is on day trading to be right, say, 70% of the time, and then you have way better odds than the casino. Now, you have to have proportionate bets, right? If you make small bets sometimes and then large bets other times, it can be a little unbalanced because the time you're wrong, it could be a larger bet, <laughs> right? So you have to be uh, disciplined. So, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I don't have a trade going on PPI. I don't care. Uh, yeah. Again, end phase just shot up because the PPI numbers. It's in the title of the video. 
Let's see. Uh, let's see here. Can anyone tell me, is it a good time to invest in U.S. stock markets? There you go. I want to give them a heads up. European inflation went down. Not sure what's going on with Powie Wowie. Yeah, it's good old U.S. wages, eh? I think U.S. wages and uh, um, otherwise are moving. Let's take a look here. So, market, yeah, you had a little bit of a consolidation there for a moment. And uh, that kind of came right back. So, good on the market. Market's happy about that. Well, NVIDIA's still doing a little bit of a bleed there. But, again, still positive, well positive compared to the... Uh, silliness that we had in pre-market. Pre-market seemed like a little depressed, hung over from yesterday. <laughs> All right, what else we got here? So Mark here says, why did you liquidate your Palantir position? Why do people start rumors like this? Like, we didn't liquidate our Palantir position. I'm not paying attention, are you? <laughs> I think people just say stuff like that to, to try to uh, bug or create rumors. Mm. TMF not going to run for a long time. It looks like, yeah, it's. It, it, I, I closed my bet on TMF a while ago just because of the uh, Jan Feb numbers. It's like, oh, nope, 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 nope. GMP says Trump will cut rates. Yeah, it's not supposed to be how it works, but that might end up being how it works. See, I've always joked that you know, both Biden and Trump contributed to the inflation we have today. Uh, you know. <laughs> and I always joke that it would be funny that Donald Trump doesn't get reelected, misses all of the crazy inflation, Biden gets in, you know, Jay Powell has to basically destroy uh, uh, pricing. Or, 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 you know, skyrocket rates and, and do what he needs to do to make everything unaffordable, basically, to try to reduce inflation. Then Trump comes back when inflation is mostly solved. And now it would just be even more ironic that rates end up only getting cut under Trump. <laughs> so that means they rates only went up during Biden and then only went down during Trump. And like, theoretically, it should have nothing to do with the, the timing of their their presidencies. It's just, I don't know, it's just like Trump luck, I guess. <laughs> because originally, obviously, there was a lot of frustration about, uh, for, for a lot of folks, about Trump not winning in 2020. But ironically, I kind of think it would, it will end up proving to be a little bit of a blessing in disguise for Trump. Because, uh... He missed the, the inflation wave, basically, the, the lagged inflation wave. So it's, it was actually kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. All right. What else do we have here? Somebody says, your mom cut her rate. Oh, okay. Oh, let's see here. Great video yesterday. Got to stand your Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Glad, glad you liked that. Yeah. CPI influenced by previous inflation without real increase in PPI. Boy, I don't even know what that means. CPI influenced by previous. Uh, oh, you're, you're basically saying CPI and, and PPI are somewhat independent. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the question is, CPI is going to measure the pass-through, right? CPI measures how much are we able to pass on to consumers as a company, Whereas PPI is how much are costs going up? Not all of those costs can get passed on because passing on price is a factor of competition. You know, people think, well, uneducated people in, in, in um, uh, economics, uneducated people in economics think that, uh, okay, well, corporate companies are just going to raise prices because they can. It, it doesn't, I mean, companies would like to do that. They would really like to do that, but they can't. So uh, there's a limit, and the limit is competition. All right, 
Let's listen to CNBC Sizzle for a moment. Control the bears, man. Uh, that's where our roadmap begins this morning. The inflation picture, of course, uh, is what we're talking about there. We've got uh, wholesale prices increasing less than expected, as Jim just said. Two banks also lowering their rate cut expectations. That's off of yesterday's CPI news. We're keeping an eye on big tech as well. Uh, in sh NVIDIA shares, they're bouncing ahead of the open. JP Morgan lowering its Apple price target. And you just what? heard from Amazon's Andy Jassy saying so many different things, including the fact that he's committed to cost cutting while investing in AI. Plenty of other stocks to track this morning. Nike, Airbnb, Chevron, Occidental. We'll go through all the upgrades and downgrades. But let's get to the broader market here. First, just let's go get a reaction to PPI after yesterday's sell-off on the CPI. Jim. Well, I mean, there was a lot to like. I think there's a lot of confusion about these numbers. Uh, I, I find that what's happened is is that yesterday there were a lot of mistakes in the data. Uh, what? You know, what do you mean? What do you mean by the mistakes? They're not, yeah. they're not taking into account a lot of a lot of e-com. Uh, for instance, they had a parallel up, but you know, the largest seller of apparel after after Amazon is is uh, Temu, and Temu's lowered the price of a Temu's apparel lowered dramatic. the price and Jassy T Timo. Timu, I heard him say that at the yeah, very top of the interview. Being, with and Andrew. they're getting good value. I mean, the yeah. average price of the yesterday of the footwear on Temu was 89 cents. I mean, you know, how can you not include this in the in the in the CPI? Yeah. PPI, I think, is a little more intelligent and more put together. By the way, food was up big because the avian the avian flu. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at the way that they do that, the labor department. I mean, I would go in there, I would clean house. I mean, I would do a little dead wood chainsaw. Yeah. Um, and, and what else here? I mean, because I think that we, I'd like to go to Carl because I need some optimism right now. Well, you're not going to get it from Carl right I, now. No, why not? The sun, that sunrise scene? I know. Scene? He, I mean, he looked great as always. But that's optimism. That's optimism. I was trying to get some optimism. It's going to be, well, he's going to be with Cities of Success, of success tonight well, at 10 o'clock. Well, that's what you're saying it's skewed. Are you saying the deck is stacked? Um, no, but what I think is interesting is you seem to want to emphasize the PPI today as opposed to the well, CPI tomorrow. Well, because I think the PPI tomorrow. is Meanwhile, we had a significant sell-off as a result of that CPI number. Right. Everybody now coming way back on their expectations for rate cuts during the course well, of this year. I don't know if many are now coalescing around one or two, certainly not June. Well, I just um, think that, that PPI we, number's not gonna change that, is We it? gotta keep perspective here. On, on, if we didn't have these aggressive projections on rate cuts, we would be like, okay, not great. But if, let me tell you something, you raise, the, the thing that worries me most is rent and housing. This, remember, housing's out of the CPI because in 1980 they were worried about housing inflation. They wanted to make the number look bit. We have an immigration problem, and we also, if we raise rates, and the affordability of housing is going to get even worse. So the Fed's in a box on housing. But, and the Fed's Some in a, people would also say the Fed's, it's not their problem, but, I mean, Richard Fisher was on yesterday talking about it again. That auction yesterday, by the way. Didn't go as well the as it might have. The, I mean, we had a little uh, just meaning there concerns about so much, like so much supply to right. help fund uh, our deficits and not enough, not enough demand, and that's a concern that, uh, as well this year. Do you share that? Concern? No, I am concerned about that because you, you you'd supply. I mean, just dramatic supply, and we are man in Chicago is uh, he's great in real heart. Saint is great in real heart. It does look like uh, Nick T just tweeted. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, so he quotes uh, John Williams, member of Powell's leadership team. Overarching goal of the Fed is now to properly balance the dual mandate. Focuses on labor market, which has been a big source of the inflation anxiety, now causing somewhat of less concern. Tremendous progress towards better balance. We have not seen total alignment of our dual mandate yet. Yeah, I don't know that any of that is really that entertaining or interesting. It does seem like Lagarde is having a little bit of a talk. Central blank strategy. Try to say it like her. Well, can I get the audio on it? I should be able to. Let's see here. Oh yeah, there we go. At an annual rate of 0.4%, up from 0.2% in January, Growth in loans to households remained unchanged in February at 0.3% on an annual basis. This is actually kind of really boring, <laughs> so we're going to pull off of that. Uh, let's go look at the sticks instead. Uh, okay, yeah, there's uh, BT Sizzle trying to play that uh, 
71,100 uh, level again. NVIDIA wants to keep pushing up. Qs want to keep pushing up on the day. Uh, some enthusiasm again here. Uh, Tesla is trying to move sideways there up about half uh, or a quarter of a basis point. Quarter of a percent, rather. And uh, very little red. Uh, now, this is interesting. We actually started the morning with more red. This is funny because look at this. You've got less red now. That's going to flip. This is going to become more red. We always get a page of red. So the question is, what's going to turn red? Uh, then we've got, who's Nick T? It's Nicky Leaks. He works for the Wall Street Journal, and he seems to know what the Fed is thinking before the Fed's thinking it. He's been used as a leak before, I think, by the Fed, so that's why. Oh, uh, let's see here. What else? Huge food monopolies like Coke and Pepsi and General Mills. You know, by by definition, Coke and Pepsi are not a monopoly given that they compete directly. So you could say maybe they're an oligopoly, but uh, I wouldn't say a monopoly. It's they're, they're, by definition, you just quote it too. Uh, what's your overall plan with cash position? 30%. You know, it depends. You can, there are a lot of things you could do. You can DCA, you can wait for little opportunities. Uh, in the meantime, you pick up 5% yield. What's wrong with that? You know? So, I think cash is kind of cool. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Okay, uh, how long do you think NVIDIA can keep demand for AI chips? When it falls, stock will be in very bad shape. Well... I think I don't think the question is how long can Nvidia keep demand for the AI chips because I think that'll be for a very long time and they'll continue to innovate and provide new ones. The question is not will the demand go away. The question is what will the growth uh, uh, of their expected revenues do? Growth. That's going to be the big question. Growth, growth, growth. Yeah, I was actually just making a Tesla video on uh, somebody's asking about Tesla valuation. I had, I'm going to finish making it probably this morning. I had to refilm it like three different times because it just it was getting too long and complicated. So we'll uh, we'll make like a little simple version this morning. So I think that'll be really interesting. Okay, what else? Uh, what else? Plenty of small companies have come in to take market share from Pepsi and Coke by offering better choice. Ooh. All right. Very good. So let's go. Um, Let's take a look at uh, what else we have. So again, we're expecting more red this morning. I mean, it could just happen in these stocks that are only up like 0.1%. But uh, in terms of what's actually moving this morning, Matterport's up five to recover yesterday. Open door three, clearly a risk on trade today. Sun run two, end phase one one or one five. Alibaba, Costco, these folks are up. Restoration hardware one. NVIDIA's uh, uh, 0.71. So, so some enthusiasm here going into uh, earnings season and uh, the market opening. So again, curious to see what kind of activity we'll get. But right now, those cues keep growing. Grow, grow, grow. <laughs> Good moves there. Let's uh, go back here for a moment. It's a nascent concern, Jim, but you're going to start hearing it that, it that Alphabet and Amazon are designing and developing their own chips in some way to at least replace part of the NVIDIA okay, ecosystem so let's go over or what, what Jensen Wong said to me. He okay. said, listen, it's terrific that they're developing it, and we're, we're working with them to develop it. Right. And, you know, one of the things we have to separate, you know, Amazon Web Services is very different from actual Amazon. And Amazon yes. Web Services is, is truly built on NVIDIA. Right. Okay. Away from that, you have a lot of good stuff that Amazon's doing. But web services is NVIDIA. And, you know, Jensen is not, you know, he always says, I come in peace. But he said to me, I hope they do a good job. They're my customer, and we'll help them in any way we, they can. You can't get the chips you want from Amazon. This is in many ways a defensive move. Because, I mean, from, a, from NVIDIA. NVIDIA not NVIDIA's out. out. Right. NVIDIA's out. They're like, you know, this Blackwell's already sold through that they're coming out with September. They haven't so, even come out with it yet. It's sold so they've through. got orders for Blackwell that obviously yeah. already. So, I mean, let's just understand that a lot of this is trying to help people who cannot get enough. I mean, if we had Michael Dell on right now, I think Michael Dell would say, listen, we're doing pretty well. We got a lot of NVIDIA. Right. right. And whoever gets the NVIDIA wins, but there's not no, enough it NVIDIA. It continues to be, right? There are the, simply the benefits to having the, the orders, having the ability. Yeah, the NVIDIA chips there are very exciting. This is an interesting piece here. There's a piece on uh, 
Yeah, CNBC, actually, the super core inflation measure shows the Fed may have a real problem on its hand. Really, what they're talking about is super core accelerating to 4.4% in March, the highest in 11 months. I don't actually think that's the highest in 11 months. I think we had a couple months ago that was the highest uh, in a while. But uh, yeah, I mean, you have this sort of like double rise. Uh, I think we put a picture of that on eHack yesterday. Right, where would that have been? Uh, right over here. This sort of uh, CPI super core month over month. There you go. Yeah, a couple months ago, you got a pretty hot level. So I feel like they, they missed that. But oh well. So something folks are paying attention to. It's super core, ongoing problem. Don't really care as long as you get back to 2%. Blah, blah, blah. It's sticky. Okay, yeah, we've heard all that nonsense before. That's interesting. But uh, nothing more than what we've seen yesterday. Let's keep going here. You know, I just don't understand how people value it so inexpensively. And, and yet all I hear about is how expensive it is. It's a bubble. It's a bubble. It's a bubble. It's a bubble. Enough with the bubble. Can we go to Carl? Yes, we can. Let's do that. Carl's in Colorado. He gives us a sneak peek of Cities of Success, Denver and Boulder premieres tonight. Carl. David, you know, uh, Jim's on the hunt for some optimism today. We should remember that the yeah. reason prices are so sticky in this country is because a lot of major metro areas are growing above trend. Tonight, we're going to take a look at that in Denver and Boulder with Cities of Success. We'll talk about it after the break. All right. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Stocks struggle to find solid footing as the latest inflation reading underscored the bumpy path the Fed faces. PPI, blah, blah, blah. I actually think the stock market is finding its footing quite well. I mean, I, I don't know what they're smoking. The market went basically straight up on that. So PPI report was positive. You've got bonds that are down four basis points now. Ah, off those highs on, on the 10. So that could actually continue to be a tailwind here for the market as it opens. You got the queues up 48 bips. NVIDIA is trying to break its high earlier this morning, uh, up 70 bips, ARM's up 74, uh, Enphase is, uh, you know, what do we got, up 1.5, uh, Tesla down 3.7, uh, Meta 76, Amazon uh, 6.7, Google 62, pretty much everything just across the board up right now. So... The hope is that that'll hold throughout the day. Uh, again, still less than a page of red over here. And so I do expect that that'll expand. That doesn't necessarily mean the indices will go down. But uh, clearly, markets are happy. And uh, BTC is still sitting at that line. Okay, what else? There must be more news to cover. So CFA final exam pass rate rises to 49%. 49, wow, so more than 50% of people not passing the CFA final exam. I know, I think the CFA, the first one, is only like a 30-something percent pass rate. It's even lower. But the final one, only half people who pass the third one? Yikes. Uh, Manhattan apartment rents dip in sign of market stabilizing? Yep. You're seeing that across the board. When you go into multifamily right now, you have to be ready to adjust rents to fill units. It's... We've been talking about that for months, though. None of that's a surprise. Bank earnings to test the stock market's resurgence. Yeah, that's true. You've got bank earnings coming up uh, over the next, uh, actually, really, tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, you're going to start with bank earnings. Yeah, tomorrow's already Friday. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So tomorrow, we get J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock, Citigroup, State Street. Some... Some big numbers. Or, uh, these are some big reports coming out tomorrow. So tomorrow morning we'll have some entertainment to look at in terms of bank earnings. And uh, so those will come out right around uh, excuse me, uh, the time we're live. So we'll cover those. William signals the Fed still has work to do in its inflation fight. That's fine. Yes, yes. What else? Without immigrants, U.S. working age pool would shrink. In 2007, 4.3 million babies were born, just beating out the previous record of 4.3, set at the peak of the baby boom in 57. That's approximate, because not all babies were recorded at the time in the 1950s. But it's basically downhill since then. Ah, 
It's been, uh, let's see, last year's total, only 3.5 million baby burn, uh, babies born. Wow, that's really interesting. Sort of the, the population growth slowdown. It's a little unideal. Robinhood slips as Citigroup downgrades to sell on disconnect from fundamentals. What? No. They basically just called Robinhood a meme. Let's see here. This has implications for the working age population. The record-setting babies of 2017 turned 16 last year. So this year, the number of native-born 16-year-olds will start falling. Interesting. So basically saying we're about to get a whole lot less native workers available to start taking jobs at the age of 18. Aha. Uh -huh. These numbers could jump around a lot. The actual population could swing. Blah, blah, blah. And then they talk about the immigrant working age population is growing. Yeah? No doubt about that. Immigration into the U.S. slowed during the first three years of the Trump administration because of declines in illegal immigration. Oh, sorry. Because of Entirely because of declines in legal immigration. Illegal immigration actually rose. That's interesting. Uh, and then scratched to a halt with the arrival of COVID-19. Oh, okay, at the beginning of his presidency. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then since then, both legal and illegal immigration have come soaring back. Oh, immigration. Yeah, they, you know, I wish we would fix the immigration system. You know, if somebody, like, I don't know, maybe it's an unpopular opinion. I just feel like if a, if a business thinks... Or if a business is willing to hire somebody and help them get housing and get them acquainted into America, why should that business not be allowed to hire them? You know, it should be like a fast track to get people in. Instead, you get like temporary workers like J1s or you get, you know, the visas that are like a lottery or special skill style visas. It's very, very complicated for just sort of a normal person who's like, hey, I want to work my ass off in America to actually get in over here. It's crazy. Or you could just cross the border illegally. That'd be the easiest way to do it, apparently. Not not condoning that, just saying. It's crazy. So, all right, let's listen in over here. At five. And I think it's really one yeah. of the great things they offer there. It's interesting. Uh, we do a bit on, uh, on VC funding. A lot of VC uh, has moved into the area. And they do say that, you're right, 20 years ago, uh, we would have moved our startup here because we like the lifestyle. We like the 300 days of sunshine. Now it's really about the fact that the labor is first. The talent pool is here, and you have the added benefit of having these things, these mountains behind you, uh, and the work from home, of course, remote work phenomenon has just accelerated that. But it's almost the inverse of what was classically the story, is that you move here for lifestyle. Now you're, you're moving here for productivity. Yeah. Can you find a place to live? Is that becoming more difficult? I'm sure that's part of your coverage as well. Yeah, Diana Olick does a great piece on how quickly you can get affordable uh, units built um, in, in a town with faster permitting and developer incentives. But that's really the, the key challenge. And we do take a look at not only the housing challenge, David, but the migrant challenge. Uh, 40,000 migrants have moved here. That's the yep. highest per capita in the country for a, a major metro. So we, we try to look at both sides tonight. Well, Carl, one of the things that I, I'm intrigued by is, is that there, there are companies that are headquartered in California, but the whole workforce is where you are. That is true. That is true. And that is why uh, a lot of the, the entrepreneurs here <laughs> are thinking in terms Giles says, Colorado is full. It gets to negative degrees. <laughs> degrees. Don't come to Colorado. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> We're full of sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Good old, good old classic uh, uh, geography. All right. So 10 minutes to go to the opening bell. Everything went pretty much positive after the PPI report. Given that PPI is incorporated in CPI, or sorry, in PCE, uh, PCE pulls both from PPI and CPI. That's leading to some optimism. So now we're looking at uh, bonds, 10 years down, 3.7, five-year break-even, inflation expectations, pretty stable. Still got that super core problem. We've got BT Sizzle trying to break that 71.1 level. It's really struggling to do that. 
and uh, the queues are uh, really slowly kind of just inching up, inching up, inching up. And so pre-market here, we're up basically the opposite of what we were down. We were down like 0.37, we're up 0.45 right now. So nice swing and doodle, very nice. And uh, now we are uh, waiting for the bail. So it's not much else. I mean, ECB, you know, maybe a few of the folks on the ECB board were ready to cut today, but markets weren't expecting it. And so Lagarde, as is usual, follows the market. That's what central bankers do now. And they try to massage the market leading up to the actual event. Um, our markets are still pricing in only... Oh, what do we got? Yeah, 1. 1. 1.7, 1. 1.8 now. Rate cuts for the end of the year. We're almost certainly not going to get a rate cut in May. And the odds of getting a cut in June are now just 21.2%. Wow. Wow, we were we were well above a 60 to 70% chance of getting a rate cut in June. And so it shows you how much CPI has an influence. Uh, you know, CPI moved this by like 40%. PPI moved it by like 4%. So a little disproportionate there. Uh, about a 50% chance of a cut in July at this point. About a 72.3% chance of one in September. And then November, you're at 80.5% uh, chance. Yeah, I... I <laughs> Yeah, the seasonally adjusted gasoline numbers. I saw that from Zero Head. Yeah, one of the problems with this, and I, I'm not suggesting that uh, it, uh, uh, like, I, I don't know enough to, uh, on this one to really comment on this. Yes, the seasonal adjustments, they, they do crap like this. Uh, and, and, and I understand that seems very frustrating, but sometimes these seasonal adjustments go in exactly the opposite way, too. Like, you know, they actually amplify rather than sort of soften the pain here. It's Zero Hedge is very anti-Biden, though, so it's very common for them to highlight this. But again, I don't know if this is normal or if this is just sort of the classic shenanigan -y of the rigging of some of the data. But, um, yeah, I mean, almost all of the CPI and, and PPI numbers we look at are seasonally adjusted. Uh, and that's normal. The The idea is, uh, uh, you know, hey, uh, we, you know, an exam, it's really designed to try to smooth out what's going on with prices. Like, you know, heating oil gets a lot more expensive when you go into the winter because more people are using it. So, you know, you don't want to, so you basically make a seasonal adjustment and go, okay, well, we already expect it's going to go up, say, 3%. So if it goes up, 3%, it didn't really change from expectations. Whereas if it goes up 4%, then it's like, oh, that's 1% more than what we would have expected. And then you know it's actually like warming up. That's the whole point of the seasonal adjustments is so you can sort of make a baseline comparison. But yeah, I mean, of course, there's, there's going to be some uh, math and funniness that goes in there and makes it inaccurate, whether that's rigging or just the inaccurate nature of humans trying to, you know, smooth out data uh, I don't I don't know but I can't really comment on that one so I'll be on what I just did so I, I know I don't know enough about those seasonal adjustments to really tell you so what else Fed Williams doesn't forecast a financial stability crisis via banking from commercial real estate uh, let's see here Apple, genuine parts will now benefit from full functionality and security afforded by original factory calibration, just like new genuine parts. Ooh. Apple to expand repair options with support for used genuine parts. Yeah. People really want to be able to repair their stuff that they buy. I don't really blame that, honestly. Uh, Apple's up about 45 basis points here in the pre-market. Five minutes to go. Zero Hedge pulls the FUD out of the best news. I like them, but you got to be careful. Yeah, I always think that's why it's a good idea to sort of have a balanced perspective and, you know, try to get your information from multiple sources. Uh, and and I, inclu I include, yeah, certainly I like 
you know, if if you want good bear arguments, they're a great place to go. <laughs> you know, if you're just trying to have bear arguments, or a bear or anti Biden, <laughs> that's there you go. Uh, Tyler says Jiro Hedge is not anti Biden, just pro truth. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that sounds like somebody who's voting for Biden. <laughs> no bias in that line at all. Of course you're commenting from X. <laughs> yes, yes, an X comment. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, that's the same thing people say about Elon. What? Elon's not politicized. He's just saying the truth. Ah, okay. Let's just put like a stamp on your forehead that tells everybody what your political persuasion is. <laughs> oh, wait, you already did that yourself. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's go see what the Doomers have. Okay, the Doomers. Attentive to those evolutions. Oh, really? They're, they're just listening to this? ...informing our uh, assessment on the basis of futures. So we look at how futures evolve as well. It's not just the, uh, the price of the, of the barrel of Brent, uh, that we look at, we also anticipate, um, try to anticipate as as well as is possible, and it's not perfect, but we try to use futures as a as a an indicator of where the markets are seeing prices of oil for the future. I'm surprised Bloomberg is so bored; they're airing Lagarde in full. <laughs> Yikes! Yikes! Somebody says, I've been watching the Dixie in the 10 year as Catalyst. How's you up doing? Hey, you up? Uh, yeah. Yeah, dollar's been rising basically since the beginning of the year. Makes sense because yields have been going up. You know, they, they're, they're basically, I mean, almost directly correlated. Uh, you've got uh, yields straight up since the beginning of the year, dollar straight up. And that makes sense. Remember, people who. Uh, want uh, the yield that America is offering, we have to buy the dollar. So when the international community says, wow, I could get 4.5% on a 10-year treasury, and they come buy 10-year treasuries, guess what they have to buy it in? Dollars. So they have to sell their currency and buy ours. It, the dollar will collapse if we're the first to cut. You know, the, the the only way the dollar really keeps staying up is basically if everybody else faces, like, let's say, a recession, we're the best of the worst. Let's say Europe goes into recession and the U.S. doesn't. Well, the dollar relative to the Europe will be way higher. The, the, the euro will collapse relative to the dollar in that sort of example. It, and vice versa. If the U.S. goes into a recession and Europe doesn't, then, uh, uh, then the dollar will be way weaker because obviously recession is going to you know, force rate cuts, and so your yield on bonds will be substantially lower. So, let's see here. The dollar is what kept the U.S. afloat. The dollar is the strongest of the Ponzi's. Don't make fun of it. Honor it. Honor the dollar. <laughs> That's like, <laughs> who's been to the statue in France, uh, or in, in Paris? Honor the ball sack. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess he was like a French novelist or whatever. Let me get this statue. Uh, and uh, I think actually Tucker Carlson mentioned him. Uh, boy, that was maybe three or four weeks ago. Some kind of book or whatever by him. I have a picture with Lauren right in front of it. I'm pretty sure I tweeted it. I thought it was kind of funny. But anyway, let's get uh, let's get the belly dues. Let me find you a deal in Atlanta. You know, I like Atlanta. We, we visited Atlanta. There's some really nice parts. By Andy Jassy. Right, that was Andy Jassy's Amazon jive. letter that you was a little jive. Like a buy on Amazon. All right, here's the opening bell. Take a look at the more time to More green than you might expect it. And we're at Here's the big board uh, doing the honors. Quantum computing company, Ion Q. Over at the NASDAQ. Solar All right, that's, that's a lot of... A lot, 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 a lot of green. Uh, I don't know how robust it's going to be off of PPI, so I am, I'm very, very interested to see how much a move we get here. Uh, quick note, somebody here says, Kevin, all your old videos pop back up. Was super confused to see one pop up from five years ago. I thought you hit them. 
so the idea was always to sort them into playlists. It took us a while to do it, but we're finally done because there were over like 4,000 videos. So what we've done is if you go to our playlist on the channel, you'll see they're all sorted now. And it's actually really cool because you can go through and go like, oh, okay, that's news, which is old. And then you can kind of look at, okay, what about real estate videos that aren't news, right? So the sorting into the playlist has been really, really functional. Uh, anyway, Tesla's trying to rock it up here. You're up about 84 bips. You got Enphase trying to rock it as well, up about uh, a little over 2% here. NVIDIA is rotating down, so not really sure what way it wants to go. The Qs are also not really sure yet. We're a little tentative. Yeah, PPI came in a little better, but I don't know if I want to play ball today. Oh, NVIDIA is not sure which it, what it wants to do. Enphase knows exactly what it wants to do today, and that's go up. It's breaking out above the 119 line, which is actually very important. It usually gets Magneto to right back down to it. Uh, Amazon just turned negative uh, by about, you know, three basis points. Google's up 50. You've got uh, Intel, uh, 24. Let's see here. Uh, somebody says, Kevin, you missed the bell. Did, how did, what, did, sounds like you missed the bell, bro. <laughs> uh, Boeing down about 45 bips and falling, falling rapidly. Uh, Embraer's down about 60 basis points. Uh, what else? What else? I'm just looking for some larger movers here. Robin the Hood got a downgrade by City. I didn't really do anything to it. Wafers up two bips. Big deal. Open doors up a percent, but rotating down. Wolf is barcoding. Matterport's up five. Ulta's up 37 bips. Reddit at 42 bucks. Trying to make a move here. Don't know if it will. Restoration Hardware comes back to life a tiny little bit after yesterday slaughtering shellacking uh somebody yesterday told me that i was uh i'm joined i've joined an indian tribe i've never heard that before but oh tesla's up a percent it's gonna go to 174 here let's see if we can break that yeah somebody said uh kevin it, it appears you've joined an indian tribe or something like that like declaring i'm a native american and he said i joined the smackaho tribe ah all right uh anyway you can see that in yesterday's video End phase, arms up fitty. Yeah, you're still getting some red candles here, though, on, on the artificial intelligence. I don't know if you're getting sort of like a sell-down going into earnings, but uh, uh, I don't know. I know uh, Nike got an upgrade today, so let's see here. Nike, Nike, what is this? Uh, Nike's up about 3%. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. All right, so, oh, there goes Apple trying to recover a little bit. Yeah, I'm trying to find that direction on the queues. It seems like the only thing really weighting the queues down right now uh, is is a little bit of a down pull there on AI, although it looks like now you're starting to get that red or green candle. So benign and slow up today is roughly what it feels like. So benign, slow, chill up. You know, CPI is behind us. Got a little bit of a soothing PPI. All right, here we go. Uh, Amazon positive again. Yeah, not not actually very much of a dramatic move today in markets. Like, what? Which? Where's the trade today? You know, Enphase kind of getting stuck at about two percent. Tesla's up one two right now, which is nice. Uh, you've got. Uh, Trump Media Group. Let's see. Let's see what's going on over at the D, D, J, T, Donald J. Trump. Let's see what we have here. I mean, it's straight down, obviously, from our, our peak over here. But uh, we are. What do we have yesterday? Yeah, I think yesterday was another rough day. I think you were down like seven or eight percent yesterday. But uh, I mean, you started the day around thirty-six. Oh, okay, ended the day around thirty-three and a half. No, nah, thirty-four-ish. Now you're at 34-ish as well, kind of flat on DJT. Okay, there goes NVIDIA. It's up. Up, up, up. Up and away. Up and away. Uh, yep, good old uh, artificial intelligence bets. You've got uh, Tesla now knocking on that door of 174. Everything broadly green. Not not a lot of bearishness here to be seen. So let's in here. Work on that too. I got a lot of stuff, David. Really? You got a lot of stuff? Oh, man. I just, we're just beginning. MedTech. I see a lot of good news. MedTech. Visa and MasterCard. Did anyone ever say a bad word about those two? Hold it, David. Stop trading. Warner Brothers Discovery. Positive. 
Let me see uh -huh. that. It's electric. Oh, that's Jessica Reef. Look at that. Jessica Reef Ehrlich. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me. You're welcome. Please. Uh, well, yesterday, as were many of the companies that have heavy debt loads, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery shares were down. Today, they're rebounding a bit to the tune of over 2%. You see this um, Disney there's got to be an out. There's algorithms out there, Jim. That any time rates move appreciably higher, it it sell all the high. It has all the all high, high leverage companies. No, they look at that. Like it, just live. This is the stuff we we always draw these lines too in the course member live stream. Live rejection at almost exactly where the line is. My line's at 174.16. Rejected at 174.17. You can't make it up to within a penny. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, how robust is the enthusiasm going to be today. The first 15 minutes are always a little loony, but uh, it doesn't feel like there's enough fire in the engine to really push us here pretty heavily. Uh, I mean, NVIDIA disagrees with that at the moment, but uh, it's uh, it's doing quite well. How did we do yesterday? Yeah, we never got to these levels. We never got to 884 yesterday on NVIDIA. So good good for them. Uh, arms up another 80-ish bips here. Pretty much everything's green. How much red do we have now? Yeah, there we go. We got more than a page of red, as we knew would happen. Carvana, Tilray, HUD-8, Boeing... Oh, Embry is there at 66 basis points. Robinhood only down 68 after that city downgrade. Not bad. 7,600. So, yeah, the stock rejected under 71.1. And phase goes back to pushing up. And uh, NVIDIA really wants to lead trading today up at that uh, 880 level. So, okay. Let's see what else uh, there is in the news world. I mean, beyond PPI, it's not terribly much this morning. Let's see. So, Euro, we talked about that. Sticky inflation sends S&P sideways as earnings kick off. Yeah, I mean, the S&P and the Qs have been kind of sideways trading anyway. Uh, if you go to the day chart on the S&P, you're, you're definitely at sort of like that rollover stage. And, and it would totally make sense to get a market consolidation, but I, I don't know if we're going to or when. So, <clears throat> yeah, right now, greed and fear index is at neutral. Market momentum is still at greed, though. Stock price strength is at greed. Breadth is at greed. Put call ratio just turned to fear. That's the first time I've seen that one rotate to fear in a while. So uh, you're getting a little bit of fear start sneaking into the markets. And, uh, yeah, somebody here says the Carvana dump. You know, what's interesting is we've been talking about them getting rejected by 92 and dumping. Uh, and they've done basically exactly that. So, uh, and, uh, and Costco, well, I was way too early on shorting this one, but it certainly topped out finally. The valuation is just kooky. Don't get me wrong, I love Costco, but uh, the valuation's kooky. Just like Wingstop, but that's the hard thing about with, sh with with shorting is you have the time value of money issue that you don't have with with long positions, because on a on both you have opportunity costs, so you wipe that out, but on a short you have to pay interest. On a long you don't because what's your capital? Uh, yeah, but again, opportunity costs in both ways, so uh, it makes it harder to to play the downside. Now, obviously, you could go options, but then you have theta decay. Like, you know, uh, one of my positions that is, it's like the only one that's not great right now is ARM. And, you know, this sucker has been bleeding out, but it's been bleeding out so slowly. Uh, you know, my theta decay is a little worse on an option that I have uh, on, on ARM. But we've talked about that one before. But I always like to be transparent. But otherwise, the trades have been freaking awesome. You know, it's, been, uh, it's been really good. So see what kind of trades we get to do today. But this rejection here is interesting. I mean, look at this. You've got Enphase, Enphase getting magnetoed right back down to, uh, it's 119. You've got, uh, looks like the market's trying to give up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, not, not the PPI. The PPI wasn't good enough. Oh, just not good enough. Perfect rejection though on Tesla. 
See, that would have been, how about your Tesla shorts? <laughs> Do people still think a short Tesla, they're not paying attention. I think I've said like 17,000 times that like I'll go in and out for a day trade or two, but I don't, I don't carry shorts on this one. Good Lord. Yeah, but anyway, um, yeah, it goes to show you again that that 174 level would be a perfect place for an entry. Those are usually the kind of plays I like to make during the day. I don't love making plays right at the open though, because you just the direction is so crazy. Uh, in the morning. Uh, sometimes the predictability is, is just uh, much harder. Unless, of course, you just inverse Kramer. Let's see what he's saying. Oh, wait, we're on Doomberg. So we can celebrate a little bit. We saw the month over month figures come in better than expected, up two tenths of a percent for the core and the headline. Year over year, base effects come into play. And so we did see an increase in the year over year numbers. But as long as those month over month numbers what are you smoking, AI science guy? Saying if, like, <laughs> it reversed on your Tesla theory? I didn't reverse on my Tesla theory. I've been very clear about my Tesla theory. That this isn't, like, I underwrite Tesla based on auto deliveries. And guess what came in way worse, as we were expecting? Auto deliveries. So when auto deliveries goes away, then the growth numbers go down for Tesla. Your valuation goes down for Tesla. Like, wake up. It's It's been very clear. I For, like three years or four years or five years, I've been saying FSD, RoboTaxi, Optimus, Insurance, they're bonuses for me. I underwrite Tesla on vehicle growth. And the vehicle growth evaporated. So, uh, you know, that, and now the question is, and I'm gonna make a video on it today. The question is, uh, when does that growth come back and how fast does it come in back? And what does the Model 2 do for that? So, um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I still can't believe the smack a -hoe tribe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Uh, <laughs> you have to go like up that comment yesterday on yesterday evening's video. Uh, anyway, so, uh, all right. So Tesla's only up 19 bits. So what's, what is happening here? Why, why is everything a little poopy doopy here? You've got, nah, Tesla's trying to go back, or, uh, Nvidia's trying to go back up. The queues are, eh, stable. It's just, it's just a classic 15-minute uh, nonsense here that's going on. So let's see here. Tesla management is also pivoting to robo-taxi prioritization over deliveries and model growth. Investments in Giga Mexico and India don't make any sense to me. Well, that's why they're not breaking ground in Mexico. They were supposed to break ground last May. And, like, here we are nearly a year later, and they still haven't broken ground because they don't need more productive capacity right now. Uh, imagine valuating Tesla as a purely a car company at this point. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, valuating isn't a word. Uh, second of all, uh, I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to imply negativity towards me for valuing Tesla as uh, a car company with a lot of growth or used to have a lot of growth. My argument has always been that the other items are so much harder to value that it's much more speculative to invest in Tesla uh, and it's much more risky and therefore it makes sense to have a lower allocation to something that has substantially more risk in valuing. So, uh, you know, I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to call me dumb, but the reality is you're, you know, trying to write something popular <laughs> but that doesn't work that way. Uh, at least I'm going to call it out. So again, you know, if I can underwrite 5 million vehicles to be delivered for 2026, and I assume a 17.5% gross vehicle margin, I could take Tesla to a certain price target. If somebody's like, oh yeah, what about RoboTaxi? I go, great. How, how much in revenue should we pick? Let's just, hmm, billion? Nah. 10 bill? Hmm, maybe. 100 bill? Oh yeah, that sounds good. It's all smoke and crack. Like, you 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 can't you you can't even assign probabilities to that because because you're just blowing smoke. So uh, it's uh, it, it, there's so much more risk. Uh, again, the reason Tesla had a higher uh, PE was because they had the growth. Now they don't have the growth anymore, uh, and so uh, so the valuation compresses substantially. So yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, what else? What else do we got? What else? Q, Q, Q. Now, it's still getting a little bit of a bleed there on the cues, you know? It's, uh, the first 15 minutes are over now. Kind of getting that little slow and soft bleedy doodle there on, uh, on the cues, down 33 basis points. 
Apple, Apple's actually moving up. Dollar's moving up. Nike's trying to bleed. Nvidia can't really figure out what direction it wants to go. Neither can Enphase. Tesla's figured it out and the answer's down. AMD down again. Meta rotating down. Microsoft rotating down. Google's rotating up. He had like six to one half dozen of the other today. You know, again, I, I like sending my trade alerts to people in the Socks and Site group. Link down below. Adding more lectures in about eight days, by the way. Totally for free. It's going to be really good. Adding some good new value. You all have some really good suggestions for new lectures, by the way. Uh, and you always, and it, it, even if you, like, there's some people who bought the Stocks and Site group, like, four or five years ago. They've gotten all the new content over the last four or five years. No extra cost. I just don't like recurring fees, but uh, some people do. But anyway, um, where were we? Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I like when I have a little bit more of a clear, clear direction. Uh, and uh, today, again, it's, it's a little interesting. Well, I, I, I personally, like, my personal opinion is that PPI should not be as bullish for markets as I think markets treated in the pre-market. And I think there's a chance maybe you're getting a little bit of that realization from the street, but it's it's nominal. I mean, you're, you're still up 30 basis points on the queue. You were negative 30 basis points before the report. BTC just sold down. You know, you just moved down another 600 bucks here on a, on a 30 minute candle. So sometimes that could be a little bit of a red flag for things to come. Enphase is going right back to 119. Tesla's now negative. And uh, AMD's almost, it's about to be negative. So you're getting sort of this unpricing of what pre-markets did for PPI. Interesting. Okay, what over here? Nothing. Some snazzy music. Okay. <clears throat> Let's listen over here. This is the Justice Department play. Justice Department wrecked iRobot. You got to buy Shark Digit. It, and it was like, now let's see how the flip side of what Chastity's, Chastity's actually talking about, the policy implications. Yes. I'm trying to make money with Shark Digit, but Shark Digit was the winner. So what the Justice Department did was gave this Chinese company the, the run of the joint. Is that what we want? No. Backfire. No, it's not. Justice Department is so out of we, touch with the reality of the, the business world. It was the FTC. It was the FTC, world. but I, I believe. I, yeah, Max here mentions uh, you've got this decline in Rivian prices sort of accelerating at the moment. Uh, well, the stock price. Stock uh, down about 2.5%, rotating down nicely here yeah, and consistently. DJT down another 30 uh, bips, now under 30, or sorry, 3%, now under 30 bips on the Qs. Yeah, you are you are trending towards a bit of a bleed here. I'm, sh I'm curious to see when we bounce uh, where we end up settling, but we'll end up having a bounce. That might be tradable, so we'll watch that. I'm going to make another coffee is what I'm going to do right now. Get a little sleepy. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to make another two coffees. I feel like I've had these, like, I don't know, I never... I. I feel like as a kid, I never used to have allergies, and now it's like spring comes around, and it's like, uh, I dead allergies. But then again, I also, like, it was so beautiful outside a week ago, I opened the window to this room. I, I, yeah, I actually have windows in here. <laughs> and it's such a bad idea, because since then, I've just been dead. It's like, oh, like the puffy eyes, and I was like, and I got this giant air filter in here too, but I don't know, man, I think I overwhelmed everything. Gosh, freaking spring, man. Although I have been watching this, like, and it's been so, like, I gotta, I gotta delete the app again. It's so, every time I have TikTok on my phone, it's a problem. But, uh, I, um, what is it? I, uh, <laughs> um, I downloaded it because I wanted to see how our videos are doing. Because we're posting some more, uh, videos. And, uh, like, my, my solar video is doing really well on some of them. Uh, and, uh, then I came across this guy and he's freaking hilarious. Uh, he's the, the Mexican word of the day guy. Uh, have, have y'all seen this guy? Hold on. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to show you the Mexican. I got it. I got to show this guy's freaking funny. Like not all of them are good, but, but they're pretty good. All right. You ready for the Mexican word of the day? Who's ready for it? All right. This is going to be part of our thing now. We got to do the Mexican word of the day while the market for Rivian is dumping. All right, hold on. Mexican word of the Mexican word of the Mexican word of the day. Eclipse. 
Make sure that when you put on your seatbelt, it clips. That's when you know it's fastened correctly. Drive safe, homie. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know why. Oh, man. Okay, I got, I got to tell you, I got, I got to delete this crap again. <laughs> it's just bad. So, <clears throat> oh, man. Eclipse. <laughs> Hey, Jack and Max, make sure Eclipse. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, dear. Okay, so, um, yeah. All right. So, where were we? I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know what, what way we're going today. I still haven't figured it out. You've got NVIDIA's trying to go sideways now. Tesla's, look at, look at that. It's almost bouncing on the 170.02 line. It actually bounced at 170.29 there. So we'll see what happens. Uh, AMD is trying to bottom out. Yeah, you're trying to get the bottoming out on Amazon as well. I like Amazon. I, I saw somebody left a comment earlier. Do I think Amazon's topping? No. I actually think uh, uh, they still got a lot of room to run. No guarantees, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. The autos are moving down a little bit right here. Doesn't seem like the interest rate sensitives are really able to hold on to gains right now. Enphase trying to pull right to that 11970 line. Also, not a surprise. And uh, chips trying to come back up along with some of the uh, mag sevens over here. We are really um, TBD, I guess, on direction today. But uh, AI seems to be doing okay, getting ready for earnings. And then some of the more speculative positions rotating down on uh, higher rates. But, but then again, PPI. I don't know how much they move rates today. Bonds. Yeah, they kind of hovered back to about four five five. So you did actually just see the market unprice uh, a little bit of that PPI excitement. That's why Enphase is probably falling all of a sudden. So the IS stocks going down because of uh, including Rivian down three and a half percent. Because of those treasury yields actually getting unpriced right away. That explains why Tesla's down about another 62 bips there. Uh, where, where it was up at the initial reaction. I see. It's just the 10-year moving back up. And phase just moved negative. And, and as we've said before, I don't actually really think that the uh, artificial intelligence plays uh, react <clears throat> to interest rates. You really have to have like... You know, to really get an AI kind of continued sell-off here, you got to get... Uh, well, I mean, you've had plenty of one on NVIDIA. Our, uh, NVIDIA's moved a lot more to the downside than ARM has, um, which was also crazy. I was expecting it to be the opposite. But um, NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA's got a good, um, you know, potential bounce there at about 850. And I think a lot of people are picking up on this. And so you're, you're actually getting more likely of a buy the dip here than you are... Uh, a continuation of a sell-off. So, okay. Good. Uh, I'm going to push the button here, and then I'll keep looking to see if there's anything else while the button's yapping. Just close the fucking door. Close the door. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. <coughs> this video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall wow. never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than House Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Yeah, well, we'll see. It's going to be entertaining. Anyway, I'm going to go make two more cups of coffee, so take me a minute. Uh, and then we're going to... Is that Jack coming? Hello? Huh. I thought maybe Jack was coming. Y'all could say hi to him, but then I don't see him coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a freaking NVIDIA. Look at that. It's perfect. It just keeps going. Uh, well, thanks for being here. Uh, I, I will be back tomorrow. Oh, quickly on Catalyst for tomorrow. No, there's not a coupon expiration tomorrow. Uh, although I will say a lot of people have been emailing us for staff uh, at staff at mekevin.com for bundle codes. Uh, next coupon I want to say is I think it's next Friday. I have to check. But anyway, um, University of Michigan.
is what you're waking up for tomorrow. But that's at 7 a.m. So that's 24 hours and five minutes away. Oh. And, ooh, BTC just went over 70 again. And that's really it tomorrow. I mean, you get import-export prices. Big deal. Nobody really cares. University of Michigan sentiment, we'll get that. And then we get into next week, which will be boring. So look at all that optimism. <laughs> That'll be fine. All right, folks, I got to go. Goodbye and Godspeed.